Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Ajma'een, tonight we'll be covering hadith 9 and 10 from Imam al Nawi's collection of 40 hadith. For hadith number 9, charging people with only what they can bear. On the authority of Abu Huraira, Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr, radiallahu anhu, who said, I heard the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, that which I warned you against, avoid it, and that which I commanded you to do, do it to the best of your ability. Indeed, what has destroyed people before you is their abundant questioning of and opposition to their prophets. Narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. For hadith number 10, confining oneself to what is lawful and wholesome. On the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, who reported that the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, God Most High is exalted above any imperfection and does not accept anything save that which is wholesome. And verily, God has commanded the believers with that which he has commanded the messengers. And so he Most High said, O messengers, eat of the good things and do righteousness. Al-Mu'minun, Ayah 53. And he most high said, O believers, eat of the good things wherewith we have provided you, and give thanks to God. Al-Baqarah, Ayah 170. Then he mentioned a person who prolongs his travel, and is dusty and disheveled, and who raises his hands to heaven, saying, O Lord, O Lord, while his food is unlawful, his drink is unlawful, his clothes are unlawful, and has been nourished with the unlawful, how on earth is someone such as this likely to be answered? Narrated by Muslim. We ask Allah to help us to, to reflect upon and benefit from these two beautiful hadith. In terms of hadith number nine, charging people with only what they can bear, we find the first main thing that's highlighted uh, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's it's very uh, it's very direct and it's it's very straightforward and it's very clear and there's there's a reason for this there's tremendous wisdom behind this sallallahu alaihi wasallam what i have warned you against then then avoid it so you find it as a direct command you don't find an approach with uh with wiggle room or you know it's it's very direct and very clear and this concept is similar to when we ask allah to protect us from shaitan when you recite Quran, then, then seek refuge in Allah from the accursed devil, from a shaitan al rajim. Notice the approach. The, the, the dua is not asking Allah, Ya Allah, help us to wrestle with shaitan and win. Ya Allah, help us in our you know, arguments with shaitan or going back and forth. No. Complete distance, right? There for, for things to for there to be this complete separation from shaitan. We don't even want to come close, right? Allah tells us in the Quran, oh you who believe, do not follow in the footsteps of shaitan. Because the approach that shaitan takes is often not one big thing. Hey, go do this giant mistake, then it's fairly easy to say no, you could say. But shaitan, his approach is do a little bit. Then a little bit, then a little, then a little, little, and before you know it, in terms of those footsteps, it turns into a mile, then it turns into a marathon in the wrong direction. We ask Allah to protect us. You find a slightly different approach from the Prophet ﷺ within this hadith in terms of what to avoid and what to do. In terms of what to avoid, think of, uh, think of a piece of firewood on the chopping block. What I've forbidden you from, avoid it, right? Point blank, avoid it. And then in terms of what I've commanded you to do, to try your best, right? So in, in terms of avoiding something, think of A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. And in terms of trying our best, think of Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The intention is to do it for Allah, most gracious, most merciful. We're going to try our best in this regard. So you find a, a, a slightly uh, different approach um, from, from the Prophet between, between these two, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What I've warned you against, avoid it. Very clear. And what I've commanded you to do, try your best. And you find you find this common theme from the from the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet would deal with people based on who they were. The Prophet would deal with people based on their maqam. The way the Prophet communicated, for example, and dealt with, you could say, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar is one thing. 
And then, you know, let's say uh, towards the end of the life of the Prophet وسلم, and you have a lot of people uh, right? You have a lot of new converts, a lot. The way the Prophet would communicate with them and deal with them was, was different in a sense than Abu Bakr and Umar because of who they were, because of their background, their station was different. Their station was different in terms of their own faith, their own faith journey. Abu Bakr and Umar, right? They were there for Badr and Uhud and Ahzab, so on and so forth. And then all the way at the end of the life of the life of the Prophet وسلم, you have a lot of new converts, right? So the Prophet would deal with people based on their station, based on their status, based on where they were at, right? And so we need to keep this in mind. The way that we deal with uh, different people should be based on who those people are, based on where they're at in their journey. And if we don't know, then we should get to know them, right? Before jumping, some people, they want to immediately jump to, uh, you know, uh, uh, forbidding this or forbidding that. Or Before you get to any rulings, get to know the person first, period, right? Get to know them. Because here's the thing, if they're struggling to pay their rent, it's not the time to talk to them about whether or not the sister wears hijab, whether or not the brother has a beard, whether or not this, that, or the other. It's not the time. If you help them with their rent, though, for example, or in terms of food, in terms of you know their 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 necessities, food, shelter, and clothing, for example, help them with that because that's the right thing to do. That will touch their heart. And then eventually, they'll start coming to the message more often. For example, it's a journey. Right, it, it's, it's a marathon, hopefully in the right direction, it's not a sprint. So we need to keep this in mind when dealing with ourselves, with our family members, with other people in the community, to be patient and to be compassionate. And then you, so the, the first uh, segment that we find in this hadith has to do with, uh, with the Prophet saying, والسلام, what I have warned you against, then avoid it. And what I've commanded you to do, number two, try your best. And then uh, you have this issue of questioning. Right, so let's break that down quickly before we move on uh, to hadith number 10, inshallah. There's nothing wrong with questioning in and of itself. In fact, Allah encourages us to ask questions, but we have to ask the right people. Allah mentions this more than once in the Quran. To ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. That has to do with whatever the field is. So if somebody is an expert in medicine and you have a question regarding medicine, you go and you ask them if a person has has a question regarding whatever it may be, if they have a question regarding their car, right, then they would go and consult a mechanic. You don't go and ask a doctor in medicine if you have an issue with your car, for example, right? So it depends on the person's forte. It depends on the, the person's niche. So we, we need to have wisdom in terms of who we're asking the questions to. And then also, what are those questions? There, there's a big difference between sincere questioning, and insincere questioning, uh, you have in Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he gives a very clear, direct command to his people. God has commanded you to slaughter a cow. They responded, Like, are, are you mocking us? Are you making fun of us? He said, I seek refuge in Allah from being from among the ignorant. And so they responded with, uh, uh, with mockery, basically. This was not sincere questioning. Okay, so what kind of cow? You know, ask your Lord. Notice, they don't even say ask our Lord. Go and ask your Lord, right? This was, this was uh, their, their unfortunate attitude towards Prophet Musa, who has this extremely high maqam with Allah Azza wa Jal. Kalimullah, subhanAllah. So they said, okay, go and ask your Lord what kind of cow? And then he comes back. Uh, ask what color? He comes back. Oh, you know, we need more information. Ask, you know, for, for, for further clarification. Then, inshallah, will be rightly guided. MashaAllah, such, such religious people, such righteous people, because they said inshallah. No, this was mockery. This was sarcastic questioning. This was not sincere questioning. There's a big difference between these two. So if our kids come and ask us questions, that's a good thing, right? But for the kids, they need to be sincere questions, right? Don't, don't make them, you know, ridiculous questions, basically. We ask Allah to grant us wisdom in, in this regard. And you have the story of the man asking, uh, uh, one of the Sahaba asking the Prophet, you know, when the Prophet uh, told him about Hajj and he asked, do we have to do it every year? And he repeated the question three times. And then the Prophet told him, if I had said yes, then you wouldn't have been able to do it. That had to do with this person asking that question repeatedly 
at the time of the prophet when this legislation was still coming down something uh, worth keeping in mind moving on to hadith number 10 confining oneself to what is lawful and wholesome notice the ayah from surah al-mu'minun ya ayyuha rusul kulu min at-tayyibat wa amalu saliha what's the reason what's the intention for us to eat what's pure and wholesome and halal what's permissible what's healthy it's not just about it being halal because you can have you know halal cheeseburgers for example but if a person if they only eat halal cheeseburgers all the time that's not going to be good for them there has to be a balance between something yes being halal but it also needs to be tayyib it also needs to be pure and wholesome so the this idea is not limited to just this idea. What do I mean by that? Allah tells us in the ayah, eat what's good صالحة, and do good deeds. Why is it important for us to eat what's good? Yes, Allah commanded us to eat what's halal and, and what's tayyib, what's, uh, what's permissible and what's pure, what's trustworthy. Why though? This gives us good energy, halal energy, so to speak, also good quality energy, there's no doubt that it's actually better for us as human beings if we follow these dietary measures and these guidelines. Why though? So that it can give us energy, and this is an important part of the intention. It's not just sami'na wa ta'ana in terms of listening and obeying to Allah and His Messenger in terms of, for example, what to eat, what not to eat, that type of thing. Yes, why though? Use that energy to do good deeds. It's not just to eat halal chicken, for example. Right, halal steak, whatever, maybe halal cheeseburgers. Use that energy to do good deeds. Right, so there's supposed to be a direct connection here. The reason why we're supposed to eat what's what's pure and permissible, right? Yes, Allah and His Messenger told us to. Yes, why though? So that we can use that energy because it gives us energy, caloric intake. Use those calories, use that energy, burn that energy in permissible ways, in good ways. And this, this also ties in uh, with the hadith because the Prophet gave the example وسلم, of the man who's traveling you know, in the desert. He's dusty and disheveled, this, this uh, difficult situation. And he calls out to Allah, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. But then what does the Prophet say? That his, his, his clothing is haram, his, uh, his nourishment is haram. All these things are haram. So how in the world is he going to be responded? Uh, uh, responded to the issue here is not just that what the man is what he's wearing is literally haram it's not just that it's not just that what he would eat is literally haram it's not just that and this is extremely important what about his income because here's the thing if a person eats all the halal and tayyib food to the T, they dot their I's and cross their T's for everything they eat being perfectly super zabiha, halal, capital Z. Amazing, awesome, mashallah. If your income is haram, then that halal food is haram. That halal chicken is haram if the income is haram. So there's a much bigger picture that we need to look at. The, 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 the food itself has its time and its place. It has its importance. The clothing has its time and its place. It has its importance. But a much bigger issue is the income itself. SubhanAllah, how many Muslims, they're so concerned about halal chicken, but then they don't care if they own a bunch of liquor stores. And there's no concern. Oh, I'm selling it, you know, mostly to non-Muslims and they come up with this rationale. No, that does not make it okay. What did the Prophet tell us in the hadith before this? What I've warned you against, avoid it. Cut it out. Move on from it. Right? Not to make things, not to oversimplify things, but this is what the Prophet is teaching us. To avoid certain things, point blank, and then to try our best in terms of, in terms of doing good. This, this uh, and I'll conclude with this, this situation of the man in the desert and his malbasu haram wa mashrabu haram, all these things are haram, okay? And, and it's also understood that his income is haram. Okay, so then what? Notice at the end of the hadith, what does the Prophet say? How in the world is God going to respond to him? The Prophet, there, there's some important nuance here, and I'll conclude with this. The Prophet, he did not necessarily say that he will definitely not receive a response. The Prophet is teaching us something with this rhetorical device. 
The Prophet is teaching us that if we're serious about wanting our du'as to be accepted and responded to, and Allah knows best what the response is. A person can have completely pure income, and they eat what they eat is pure, and what they wear is pure, all that is pure. They may ask Allah for something, and Allah does not give it to them for their own good. So it does not necessarily mean that we get every single thing that we ask for when we ask for it. It may not be good for us, or it may be good for us, right? But there, there's an important, an important point to take away from this. What should this man do in this situation? Okay, the reality is the income is not good. The food is not good. The clothing is not good. The, okay, so does that mean there's no hope for him? What is the hope for him? To do tawbah, to ask Allah for forgiveness. Right To ask Allah, Ya Allah, forgive me for all the, 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 the impermissible income that I've made. Ya Allah, forgive me. I'm going, to, I'm going to change my ways. And I ask you to help me in doing so. Ya Allah, I know that my, my, my clothing is not good and my food is not good and my drink is not good. All these things are not good. Ya Allah, forgive me for these things. I'm hitting the reset button with you, Ya Allah. Forgive me for all of my mistakes. These mistakes and everything else in addition to that. Ya Allah, I beg you. Please forgive me for all of my mistakes. These mistakes and everything else. And help me to go in the right direction. Help me to earn halal income. Help me to eat what's pure and to wear what's pure and to drink what's pure. And ya Allah, help me in this dire situation of mine. Right? Notice the, the, the ending of the hadith. The Prophet, he ended it with this powerful rhetorical device. How in the world is he going, is he going to receive a response if this is his state? So what should he do to facilitate a response? Do tawbah. We, we, we find in, in Surah Sad, Prophet Sulaiman reminding us of, teaching us of this formula. Obviously with Prophet Sulaiman it's a very different situation. It's an extremely different situation than this man. But we still find this formula. He asks Allah for forgiveness and then he asks Allah for something huge. So we should learn from this. Right, to ask Allah for forgiveness and then to ask, that's the purification and then you have the decoration. To ask Allah for forgiveness for any and all of our mistakes and then to ask Allah, don't just ask Allah, ask Allah for something big. Ask Allah for something huge. Prophet Sulaiman asked Allah for forgiveness and then a kingdom the like of which not a single person would ever have after him and Allah accepted and answered to that dua and gave him more than he asked for, subhanAllah. So look at Allah's generosity, look at Allah's maghfirah, look at Allah's forgiveness. So to conclude with the dua, we ask Allah to help us to, to avoid what the Prophet taught us to avoid sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And we ask Allah to help us to try our best to do the good that the Prophet advised us to do sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We ask Allah, we ask Allah for a pure income, we ask Allah for a pure lifestyle, we ask Allah for not only the, 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 perf the pure food and drink and clothing, but especially as it relates to the income, we ask Allah to accept our tawbah here and now. We ask Allah to, to accept us, asking Him, begging Him for forgiveness. We ask Allah to, to forgive us for any and all of the mistakes that we've made in the past, the major ones, the minor ones, anything in between. We ask Allah for a clean slate. We ask Allah to help us to turn a new page in each and every one of our relationships with Him. We ask Allah for that. We ask Allah to grant us new beginnings, fresh beginnings, a fresh start. We ask Allah to give us that hope. We ask Allah to increase us in hope. We ask Allah to grant us balance. We ask Allah to increase us in wisdom and knowledge. We ask Allah to increase us in understanding. We ask Allah to help us to understand this deen and to practice it as best we can. Amni Rabbil Alameen. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon. Wa Salaamun Ala Al-Mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.